John Fu once said to me, your generation has it easy. When he started meditating as a young man, there were no books, no explanations, no seven steps, no method one, method two. In fact, there were no books in the forest tradition at all. When he went for his first meditation instructions, they were to get the mind down. So he focused it down, 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 down. And he found that it became very uncomfortable, very restricted. He realized this can't be right. So he brought it up, 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 up. And finally I found the point of balance. It's an important principle. Even though we do have books now, lots of explanations, the suttas are translated, the basic teachings of the Greater Johns are translated. Still, when we take their teachings, we have to apply them. And we have to figure out how they fit in with where our minds are right now. Which teaching is appropriate for us right now? And we have to learn how to use the books. We tend to have the feeling that wisdom is going to be a textbook affair. But your mind is not a textbook. You are not a textbook. The textbooks are there. Where do they come from? Well, they came from people's experience. And they're meant to point you back at your experience. In particular, to make you sensitive to what you're doing. You notice that when the Buddha describes his awakening in the shortest terms, it's a principle of causality, how actions bring results. And not just any actions, your, your actions, human actions. He didn't define awakening as seeing that there is no self, or seeing something about the nature of the world, aside from the nature of causality, the nature of action. And the important teachings there in that nature of action are that some of the things you're going to experience right now come from the past, but some of them come from your decisions in the present moment. And so the lesson there is be very attentive to what you're deciding to do right now. Be very sensitive to what you're doing and to the results that you're getting from your actions. Because as he taught in the Four Noble Truths, some of the things you're doing right now are leading to suffering. There are other things you could be doing that would lead away from suffering. And he gives you pointers as to what to look for. But then you have to figure out, well, what are those pointers pointing to? You have to learn how to read yourself, see what needs to be done. This basically comes down to two big things. One is figure out what is skillful right now, what is unskillful. And the second is making yourself want to do what is skillful. And this applies in the meditation and applies outside the meditation as well. We're in your situation where people are making strong demands on you, and you're tired, and you're not focused, what do you draw on to say the skillful thing and do the skillful thing, and to figure out what the skillful thing might be? That requires your sensitivity. In some areas, the Buddha gives you some lessons, some tips to begin with about the five precepts. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no taking of intoxicants. Those are things he says you don't have to test. You don't have to reinvent the Dharma wheel there. But you have to get more sensitive to how you apply those precepts in a way where you don't break the precept, but at the same time you don't do anything, anything unskillful. That requires sensitivity. Then you take that sensitivity and you apply it to the mind, because in order to have the strength to do the right thing, 
You need to get the mind into concentration. And the question is, where are you right now with respect to concentration? Are you north of it or south of it, east or west, left or right? In other words, which direction do you have to go right now? Do you need more energy or less energy? Do you need to think more about the breath or think less about the breath? That's something you have to learn how to read for yourself. As we noted this afternoon, the Buddha's instructions in breath meditation are you get sensitive to fabrication and then you try to calm it down. But in other places, he says, before you calm things down, you've got to activate them. You've got to energize them. This, of course, will depend on what your level of energy is right now. So you have to learn how to read it. If you find yourself drifting off, okay, it's a sign you're getting too calm. You can sit here in, in kind of a haze, what they call delusion concentration, where things are still, but you don't know, don't know quite where you are. That's because the mind is not active enough. So you try to activate it. You try to be more conscious about thinking about the different parts of the body and how the breath relates to the different parts of the body. Now you can breathe in a way that's more nourishing, say, for your toes and your feet and your legs, your pelvis, your torso, your arms, your head. Try to get the whole body involved in the breathing process. And your mind will be running back and forth around the body as you're checking things out. And then there will come a time when, okay, you've expanded the breath as much as you can. And then you can focus on one of the intersections of the breath channels where everything comes together. So you don't have to be running around, checking out on your toes, checking out on your fingers. You can settle down in one spot and feel connected to everything else. That's how you energize yourself and then calm yourself down. Other times the mind is frenetic and you have to say, oh, I'm just going to stay with one spot for the time being. Get that one spot as still as I can. And then think about analyzing the breath. So you have to learn how to read what you need. And of course there are times when you know what you need to do, but the mind is inclined in another direction. And here, too, you have to learn how to read yourself. As the Buddha said, it's a sign of mature wisdom that you know how to talk yourself into doing things that you don't like doing but you know will give good results, and how to talk yourself out of doing things that you like doing but you know will give bad results. And you have to be the one who figures out what your mind responds to, where it finally will admit, yes, I do have to do what needs to be done. And it may wiggle and it may squirm. But who else is going to know the wigglings and squirmings of your mind better than you? This is an area where you have to exercise your own judgment and your own sensitivity and try your ingenuity. Because the wiggling and the squirming, they're pretty clever. They know how to wiggle their way out of all kinds of things. You'd have, you have to ask yourself, how much longer do you want to follow them? How much longer do you want to identify with them? They look very much like you, because you've taken them on as your identities in the past. But just because they look like you doesn't mean that they are you. You can say, no, this is not me now. It maybe it was me in the past, but it doesn't have to be me now. Otherwise you get stuck in the same old ruts again and again and again. Because you're not observant. You're not reading yourself. You're not sensitive to what you're doing. What, what is the mind like about unskillful habits? What does it dislike about skillful ones? What is the allure of unskillful things? You have to track that down. 
then it may have to go through many layers before you find out what the real reason is. In the meantime, you have to energize your desire to figure this out and to see these wigglings and squirmings not as your friends or not as yourself. but as your enemies. Because if you can't divest yourself even of these unskillful things, how are you going to learn how to apply the perception of not-self to things that are more and more skillful? And how are you going to even see the perception of self as an action? We tend to think of ourselves as a solid thing somehow. There's the me in there that's doing all these things. But the Buddha has you step back and say, instead of looking for the me, he says, well, look at how you create the me, how you construct the me. It's an activity, too. And if you're not sensitive to your more blatant activities, you're certainly not going to see this. So the practice is largely a practice in getting to know yourself. We think here we're getting to know the Dharma. And the Dharma says insight means this, insight means that. But it basically means getting sensitive to what you're doing and realizing where you're causing yourself unnecessary suffering. That's what the Four Noble Truths are all about. I was reading a passage a while back, a footnote in a book, translations of suttas. There's a passage about analysis of qualities. One of the factors for awakening is the discernment factor, the wisdom factor. And the translator was saying, this is the d wisdom factor, and yet it's defined as being sensitive to what is skillful and what is unskillful in the mind. And I was puzzled by the and yet. Apparently the translator was saying insight means, or discernment means, seeing things in terms of the three characteristics. But the three characteristics have their meaning basically as three perceptions. And the perceptions are there for you to look at what you're doing and learn how to disidentify with what you're doing and when you find that it's unskillful, when you find that it's causing suffering. In other words, the real issues of wisdom and discernment are what's skillful and what's not. And as I said, you can learn lessons in blatant ways, but then you have to learn how to apply those lessons to your life, to what you're doing right now, because it's what you're doing is where the real issue is. The issue is not there in the textbooks. The issue is in your decisions right now. Why are they causing you suffering, even though you don't want to suffer? Why are they causing you stress, even though you don't want to experience stress? Because there are times when there is dukkha in your concentration. It's certainly not suffering, but it is stress. This is why we have to translate dukkha with that phrase, stress and suffering, to remind you that it covers the whole gamut from blatant suffering aging, illness, and death, separation, to the more subtle stress or disturbance in the mind. When the mind gets into deep concentration, there's still going to be a disturbance there. If you're looking for suffering there, you're not going to find it. You have to look for stress. And that means you have to learn how to be really sensitive to what you're doing and to the results. So discernment grows out of alertness, grows out of ardency, the desire to do these well. And when you combine it with mindfulness, then it becomes cumulative. You get lessons that you learn and they go deeper and deeper and deeper. So work on these qualities. Be really alert to what you're doing, to what the results are. 
try to do things well, try to figure out what needs to be done. When you've learned something good, remember it. And see if you can apply that again and again. Then you get more sensitive to what lessons apply when. Remember that as well. And this is how you learn how to read your mind. And then get it to do what really is skillful. In a way that it can take itself beyond all the suffering and stress it's causing itself. To a dimension where there's no suffering or stress at all. That's something that's not done. And you know that you've arrived there because you become really sensitive to what your actions are in the mind. So again, it's your sensitivity that's going to be your guarantee. That will detect any clinging around that dimension. And also be your guarantee so you know that when you've hit that dimension you really are not fabricating anything. Because you've learned fabrications really, really minutely as you've developed your sensitivity to what you're doing right now.